can revise. Okay, that's quite an important thing to be able to do. And the, the thing with the videos is that you're able to pause them. You're able to take extra notes from them. You're able to rewind bits that you're not sure about and go back over them. So that's, I, I think, one of the real benefits to this, this age that we have, where we look at videos possibly more than we read text. Right? Now, we had this conversation about positive and normative statements. Again, it's, it's, it's the terminology that we are introducing you to at this point. So on that Unit 1 website, there was a whole list of terms that were in there, and some of those terms would include things like positive statements and normative statements. And as we said, and, and Tanish, you got it absolutely right, normative statements, they're the ones that are based on values, right? They're very subjective, right? Right? Positive statements, they are the ones that are based on facts. They are very objective. Okay, so in the context of what we talk about in economics, we are going to find that there is quite a significant difference between these two. And so then when we talk about, say, government rules and regulations, okay, so the government puts a law in place. Why has it put that law in place? Well, it might have put the law in place because of certain key facts, right? They've learned this does this, so therefore we need to put a law in place that does this. Or it might be that they're putting these laws in place because of certain values, right? And those values are going to be very subjective, right? So one of the classic ones, when we look at your key concepts, there are words in there about equality and equity, right? Now, they tend to be quite, well, equity in particular, tends to be very subjective, right? The word equity is about fairness. Well, what you understand by fairness and what I understand by fairness might be two different things, yeah? And if you've got siblings in your house, you've probably heard the expression, it's not fair, right, before. Okay? Whereas the positive statements, they're the ones that are based on facts, so the equality aspect, equal, treating people equally, right, giving people equal pay right, for their job, their task that they have done, that's all very fact-based, very objective. There really isn't any argument with regards to it. And this is one of the big sort of TOK-ish aspects of what we talk about in economics because you see a lot of this in the news, Okay, and there is, there are, <coughs> excuse me, normative statements in economics. There are plenty of them, but there are also a number of positive statements based on facts. And when we are discussing this, we need to have that understanding so that we know this is a value-based judgment and this is a positive one. All right, well done, team. Okay, moving on. The next thing I'm going to introduce you to, it is your very first model in economics. The very first one, the first one you learn. And it is so cool, it is so big that we can call it a super model. Yeah, there's a, a little wee joke impact with that, right? We call it, and it's written there, a PPF, or if you will, a production possibility frontier. Now, the word frontier is a very old-fashioned word. It kind of, you know, harks back to sort of cowboys and Indians in America, like the frontier, yeah? Um, so sometimes you'll see it actually written as PPC, which is production possibility curve. And what we're attempting to do with this supermodel is we're attempting to model an entire economy, the whole lot and what it produces. Now, that sounds like an incredibly difficult thing to do, but it turns out that this model is actually a lot more straightforward than we think. It's called the PPF. So what does it look like? Well, like this. Ta-da! I don't know if anybody knows Korean, but that's an attempt at Korean there. All right? <clears throat> so, Production Possibility Frontier, PPF. Looks like this, all right? You'll see here, there is a good here 
and there is another good here. So what we're doing is we're plotting on these axes. All right. So this is imagine this is um, Malaysia. Why not? We're in Malaysia, so let's imagine this is Malaysia. This is Malaysia's production possibility frontier. So the entire economy of Malaysia. We've got to make some assumptions. All right. So one of the first assumptions we may, need to make is that Malaysia is only able to make pizza and sugar. That's it. So two goods, that's all the country is able to be made. If we're trying to make more than two goods, this, re this model really isn't going to work because this model is a simplification. Right? It's trying to get the real world and shrink it down to a point where we can analyze it and, and get some predictions out of it that make it straightforward. So here we go. So we've got pizza here and sugar here. So this, this is an axis, like you see in maths. Oh, you've done maths already today, so this is something that you'll be familiar with. So these axes start here. So that's where zero is. So as we go up the axis, we're going to be producing more and more and more and more and more pizza. Or as we go up the axis here, we're going to be producing more and more and more and more sugar. Now, if we were to use every single resource we've got to just produce pizza, then we'd end up here. All right, so that is the limit, that one, that point there, the limit to the total amount of pizza we can make. If we were to put all of our resources into the production of sugar, then we would go all the way down to here, to this point, and that point there would be the maximum amount of sugar we could produce. Now, what the production possibility frontier curve represents is all possible combinations of pizza and sugar we can possibly make, the maximum, right, all the way along here. So whatever these numbers are, that's the best we can do, right? So any numbers that are out here, say F, for example, we can't get to F. We don't have the resources. We don't have the technology, right? We cannot get out to F, right? F is unobtainable which I, I in, the, in the past, I used to use a joke about um, a TV, a uh, TV, a movie, uh, just to jump back into the media. Uh, uh, there was a movie that was very popular. In fact, it is the highest grossing movie of all time. Um, and it is called, what? Know the name of the highest grossing movie of all time? It was, Recently beaten by it was, it was Avatar, right? Talking about Avatar, right? Yes, Avatar, absolutely. And apparently, there's going to be sequels to Avatar, like Avatar two, three, four, five. I don't know, lots of them. But yes, Avatar is the highest-grossing movie of all time. It was the Avengers Endgame movie that got passed by Avatar when they re-released Avatar, and that gave it even more money, all right? So a little bit of cheating perhaps going on there. I'm not entirely sure about that. But one of the key plot lines, because obviously you've all seen Avatar, uh, one of the key plot lines in Avatar is it's about resources, right? It's a whole battle on an alien planet for the resources of that planet. And there's a really rare resource on that particular planet, or well, in fact there's a few, but the really rare resource that they're wanting is this resource that was rather imaginally called unobtainium, <laughs> which, which I've always found quite funny, um, but Zarfan's looking at me like, that's not a joke, come on Mr. David, come up with a better joke than that, I've just had maths, I need to be humoured, um, so let's have a look then at our PPF again. Here it is. So if we're on point F, so anywhere out here is unobtainable. So this is your limit, your frontier. Right? You can't go out there. What about inside? So if we're inside, then we're not producing at the limit. Now, what that means is that these combinations, any of them in here at all, are what we call inefficient. They're inefficient combinations because they're not doing everything they possibly could. If we're on the curve, then that's the best we can do with the resources and technology that we've got. Right? Anywhere on the curve. If we're inside the curve, 
we're not using the resources to the best we can. Yeah. So you've heard those sorts of comments before. You might have heard, you know, people saying about um, companies that they're not, you know, they're not producing at the best they possibly can. Yeah. Or sports teams, they're not doing the best they possibly can. Or individual athletes, you know, they've got so much potential, but they're not doing as best as they can. That's kind of what we're talking about, but from an economic point of view. F, unavailable, B, A, and C, they're all the ones that are the best we can possibly do at this particular time. Uh, and then D and E, they're the ones where there is, it's inefficient. Right? They're not using all of their resources in here. Now, uh, okay, jumping back into the meat, here we go very quickly. What do you call, there's an economic term that we use to describe a situation when we're not using all of our resources, all right? And it begins with the letter U. What economic term do you think it is if we're talking about not using all of our resources? Under allocation, yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. That's a slightly different one. Beginning with you. It always begins with you. Have a think. What does it kind of sound like if you're not using all of your resources? Quite a long word, right? Joshua was really close. It's got the first two letters, right? Would the rest of the word be? Think of any un words? It's an un. As soon as you come up with this word, you're going to go, oh, yes, of course. And then you're also going to start seeing why I'm referring to it as a supermodel. Unproductive. Oh, good one, young wife. That is another unword, and it does actually refer to kind of what we're looking at, but it is another unword. You're so on the right track. I'll give you a clue. Oh, under production. Yes, you're on the right path as well. All right, the next letter after the U and the N is the letter E. Unemployed. Fantastic. Now, well done. Unemployed, inefficient. Yeah, you'd, you'd say inefficient. You wouldn't, but yes, it is indeed inefficient. But we are thinking unemployment. So let's have a look at this now. Where are we? Where's our model? Where's it gone? Here it is. This model can illustrate unemployment. It can also, if we're on the curve, illustrate full. See that? Fully utilized. We utilizing means use. Okay. We are fully using all of our resources. So that's full employment. We've got no unemployment on that curve. We've got unemployment in here, and we've got full employment out here. And then we've got this F, which is sitting all the way out there that we can't quite reach. So this one model is able to illustrate unemployment. That's pretty cool. And full employment. But what else can it illustrate? Just this one model. Well, before, before you do that, how about you have a go at just drawing that simple model? Ready, set, go. 30 odd seconds, see what you can do. I know you're trying to do it on the computer and it's a bit tricky, or you might have an iPad and that's a bit easier, but have a go. What does the PPC model look like? Oh, that's a good one, Luckman. Well done. Some good ones coming up now. Good, got the curve going right. Well done. I'm going to shatter all of your brain cells soon. But you didn't think you were going to have to think this hard on a Monday. Good work, FIFA. Well done. All 
right? Yep, we've got the curve going on. Oh, I like it, Zarfan. Well done. You're actually annotating it. Good man. You might even remember it from your IGCSE days a while back. Oh, I see. We've got good A and good B. Adam, well done. That's a very good idea. Well done, Tira. Wait on a couple more. Have a go. Good work. Well done, team. Like it, Amira. I don't know about you. I don't know if you're finding it. Do you think it's a difficult model to draw? What do we think? Easy? Difficult? Easy to draw? No, not easy, not that hard, okay. Oh, no, it's easy, okay. And that's part of its appeal, right? It's kind of like a banana, it's very appealing. <laughs> no, okay, just checking, all right because it is relatively simple, and yet we're gonna find that it actually contains an awful lot of theory, right? So we've already seen that it will help us to illustrate the idea about unemployment, but it's gonna do more than that, right? So what we're gonna do, well done team, is I'm gonna move on to the next one. You all right if I move on, Adam? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so check this one out. All right, this is where we were. All right, this is us, Luckman. This is all of us. Don't worry. Okay, A, B, and C, they're all efficient output combinations because they are on the PPC. All right, these were the ones that were inefficient, okay, or not all resources fully used. And this one out here, we're not able to get. Now, you might have noticed I said we're not able to get it with the current technology with the current level of resources. So there's a possibility that we could get there. Right? And what we can say is, dum dum dum, hopefully, yes, here we go. Check this out. We can look at the production possible. I know this is now wheat and cotton, don't panic, right? It doesn't matter what, what's on the axis, strictly speaking. Right? If we were to decide as a society that we are at point A, and we want to move to point B. So what we're doing there is we're saying, okay, we're producing A of wheat, so 200 units of wheat and 300 units of cotton. Now we're gonna to move to B, and in B, we're making 160 units of wheat, but 400 units of cotton. So the decision that we've made as a society is we wanna make more cotton. So. You remember we talked a while back about what, how, and for whom, okay? Those three economic questions. So this is part of that. This is the what. What are we going to produce? So in society, we've made that decision. We've decided to produce more cotton. But what we are able to illustrate with this model is, check this out. We've actually lost some of our production of wheat. By gaining here uh, 100 units of cotton, we've lost 40 units of wheat. Right? So the 100 extra tons of cotton, it's tons apparently, uh, involves giving up, sacrificing 40 tons of wheat. 
So what this is illustrating is an economic idea that's in your terminology called opportunity cost. Right? So we've made a decision. There's an economic decision that's been made. With our scarce resources, we want to produce more cotton. But by doing that, because we've got this limit, okay, in order to produce that meaning more cotton, we have to decrease the amount of wheat we make. So that is called an opportunity cost. We have lost this much wheat in order to gain this much cotton. So this model can illustrate unemployment, full employment, and now it can also illustrate the idea of opportunity cost. That's super awesome. Right? Think about all of that. But I said that this is your limit. So this is actually also illustrating scarcity because we can't get to F, which was out here. So this is the limit. So it's also actually illustrating scarcity. But then we're making a decision here. So it's illustrating the idea of choice. We're making a choice, an economic decision. Gosh, this is an amazing model. And yet it's so straightforward to draw. So let's have a think. What else can it do? But before we do that, no, let's go back one. Uh, in fact, let's go back. Yeah, let's just stay here. Um, right. I'm going to open up a jam board and show you my vast artistic skills. Here it is. Creating jam. <laughs> let's have a jam. All right. I'm going to share this on with you. Send it now. All right. So you should hopefully see in front of you a jam board. Yes, our fan has joined. Good, there's a few of you joining now. Fantastic. All right, so what we're going to do in this, uh, I'm going to grab a pen. I'm going to do black here with a pen color. Might make it a bit easier to see. And I'm going to attempt to illustrate a PPC. Look at this. Check this out. Now, I've drawn a few of these before. All right, so don't panic too much at my vast artistic skills. All right. Now, we could quite easily just do little text boxes. And, and as I said, it really doesn't matter what you put on the axis. So in here, I might put um, guns. Why not? You think that's all right, Luckman? Guns. And what's the complete opposite of guns? Butter. Let's imagine our economy makes guns and butter. All right, guns and butter. Where did it go? <laughs> Here is my jam. Here it is. So let's go back to the pen, and I'm going to illustrate a point here. Let's find it. Here it is, point A. Here it is. And then as we saw, we could actually illustrate the opportunity cost because we had a movement from A to B, which says I'm going to give up that many guns. Probably a good idea to give up the guns, maybe. I guess unless you're an American. All right. And you gain that many butter. Dude, yeah, I know, sometimes my, my humor gets a little political. I apologize. Um, yes. Oh, that was good, was it? Okay. Um, yeah, just, I, I do need to be careful sometimes with my sense of humor. And sometimes my jokes might get a little bit edgy. So I do need to watch that. Right, so this is the amount that we have lost in here. And this is the amount we have gained. So that's the idea of opportunity cost. But we did say that there was another point out here, and it was point F. And we can't get there, yeah, because it's unobtainable. But the, why was it unobtainable? It was unobtainable because of the level of the existing level of technology and resources. All right, let's make it pink. All right, no way. 
So if we were to change the level of resources and technology, then surely we might be able to reach that. And we know this. We know that technology changes all the time. I'm really excited by some of the new technologies that are coming on. I cannot wait to see what happens with AR and VR. Now, remember, I'm so old that I remember blackboards and chalk. All right? Okay? I, I've been alive since before computers. All right? You know, personal computers at any rate. Okay? Um, I've been alive since before. I mean, you, you too. You're all. How old are you guys? 15, 16, 20, I don't know. But you also have been alive before smartphones. Think about that. The smartphones have only been around for 13 years. Right? So before then, you didn't have smartphones. Right? So that has changed. Now let's have a look at see what happens. So if this is what is possible to produce now, right? so that is in the year 21, Let's see what happens when we get to the year 2022 and we discover a whole lot of new resources and a whole lot of new technologies. Oh, look at that. Okay, my graph is getting a little out of shape, but that's okay. I'm a little out of shape too. <laughs> All right, and 22. So maybe next year, we're gonna discover new technology, new resources. What did I had a highlighter? No, no. Okay. New technology. New, it could be anything. It could be the ARs and the VRs. You know, they're making all these robots now. Uh, it could be all sorts of really exciting things. Or maybe we just, I don't know, drill for oil and discover a whole lot of oil in Nexus's backyard. Yeah. And all of a sudden, boom, out goes the economy. Look at that. What wasn't possible before is now possible. Now we can reach that level. So it was unobtainable before. Now it is within our production possibility. So what we've actually done is we've used this one model and we have now illustrated the concept known as... Can I grow? With an exclamation mark. Yeah. Just like that. Isn't that amazing? This one model. What do we got here? Scarcity, choice, opportunity cost, and now we've got economic growth as well. But wait, as all good infomodels say, infomercials say, there's more. Yes, why is the model a curve and not a straight line? That's a really important question, and you, you've kind of jumped the gun a little bit because that was going to be one of my questions later. I'm just going to shrink this down and then I'm going to come back to you all here and go back to here. Yes, we're going to come back to that very important question. Don't panic. We will get there. All right. But first, can you illustrate opportunity cost and economic growth using a PPC model? And go. FIFA racing to the lead, well done. Work team. Good curves going on. Team. Yes, you've got opportunity cost there. Well done. Here's your economic growth there. Good, I see that. There's opportunity cost. That's good. I've got the labels going on. Well done. Okay, we've got labels to illustrate here. And you've got the growth of the curve moving out. Well done. Mira, I like yours. It's very clearly labeled. Very good. 
works are fan. Stadia. Very nice, Sino. Well done. What's that, Joshua? Oh, Faisal. Brilliant. Look at that. Mm. Well, and Young Wise submitted with. Uh, oh, good. You've got the labeling going on in there, too. Well done. Okay. Keep waiting a bit longer. And yes, in economics, and you can actually get marks for doing just this. All right, this is just drawing this model and explaining what's happening. And again, it's a super model. It's one that you can understand, you can use, you can illustrate these economic ideas to other people who may not know about economics. What a brilliant model. Work center. And we are going to talk a little bit about the gentleman who created the model. Well done. I like the work you're doing. Yep, that's good, Luckman. That's good. That shows economic growth there. Well done. I used guns and butter a little bit sort of tongue-in-cheek wise, a little bit for the sense of humor that it um, gives, because the two products are quite clearly very unusually opposite. But, believe it or not, in the past, they actually were used as guns and butter for this exact model. Right? And for one very important reason. And that reason is going to come back to us when we start talking about whether it is a straight line or whether it is a curve and what the two mean. Um, look at that. Good work, team. All right, so what we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to push on. Now, you can always practice these again, okay? You can always practice them again. More practice is always better than less, okay? And don't panic, this was not the last time you're going to see a PPC model. Whoop. Here he is, the man himself. I don't know if he looks familiar to any of you, but his name, all the way back when, is Vilfredo Pareto, one of the best names in all of economics. Isn't that a cool name? I'm probably pronouncing it really badly, to be perfectly fair. That's all right. One of the things he talked about is this idea of an optimum. Now, the word optimum, okay, is about best, okay, so the best allocation of resources. That's what he's talking about. Not that he thinks your mum is fancy, all right? Well, she's an optimum, all right? Um, the optimum allocation of resources of a society is not attained unless it is possible to make at least one individual better off while keeping others from being better off as well. Mm -hmm. So what he's saying, and I'm just going to stop the sharing just for a minute and jump back to the meeting, is that because you've got that PPC curve, because it's, right, it's there, yeah? The idea is, is that what he's saying to try and put a more modern way of expressing it, Okay, is that it's not possible to make one person better off, right, one person more wealthy, without making another person worse off. So what he's saying is the best you can do is being on the curve. Okay, so if you're on that curve and you're making a decision moving around the curve, one section of the curve is gaining and the other is losing. You're making one group, the group who produce butter, wealthier at the expense of the group who make guns. That's what he is suggesting. Uh, you, you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul sort of idea. Right? So it's that idea of optimization. He's one of the first people to really kind of uh, numerically figure out that it might be possible to come up with a really awesome optimal, right, 
uh, view of how resources in society could be allocated. And remember, that's one of the key things that we're wondering. The what, the how, and the for whom. How are we going to do this? Well, if we're on the curve, then that, he says, is the best we can possibly do. All right. He also said some other things. All right. One of the things that he said is this, and you might have heard this one before. For many events, roughly 80% of the effects come from 20% of the causes. Now, if that sounds a little familiar to you, is that's because that's become very popular modern in the modern times with regards to what's called time management. All right? So people nowadays talk about what's called an 80-20 rule, where they work out that 80% of their results come from 20% of their, their work. So they're suggesting that you need to push your time into that 20% in order to get that 80% return and just basically ignore the rest. Yeah? Uh, he also said, when it is useful to them, men believe a theory to which, of which they know nothing more than its name, <laughs> which I find quite hilarious considering the current state of society that we live in. All right? Uh, and he talks about all sorts of other things as well. He's quite a, a fascinating gentleman, Alfredo Pareto. And his name there, Pareto, you will often hear possibly used if people talk about his model, this idea of optimum allocation of resources. They may talk about it as a Pareto optimum or Pareto optimality, right? because it's the name of the guy who invented it. It's one of the really cool things about economics is that if you come up with something, then, you know, chances are they'll name it after you. All right. Okay. Let's go back one. Sorry, I'm jumping around. Now, there's your PPC. Opportunity cost. Economic growth. All right. If there was a war or a natural disaster or a global pandemic, what would happen to the PPC potentially? If there's a war, a global pandemic, what might we see happen to the PPC? Yes, well done, absolutely right. Instead of expanding out, it would contract in, all right? It would shrink, get smaller, all right? And that's what we're seeing all around the world, economies shrinking, yeah? Okay, now we're gonna answer that question about it being a curve and not a straight line, but we're gonna leave that for another day, if that's okay with you, all right? Because already I think your minds are just going, all right, with all of this. The PPC curve is an amazing model. We are going to pick up from that model, plus we're going to discuss uh, a couple of other terms and ideas that we need to know in the next session that we have. All right. Um, you need to be working also in the next little bit on your famous economist. All right. And do make sure that the one you pick, you can't double up. So if somebody gets in first, then you're going to have to choose somebody else. All right. Otherwise, team, I will be available if you have particular questions. All right. You can I'll, the meet will stay open for the next little bit. Um, you can stay on at the end of the lesson. You can wait till everybody's out and come back into the meet. All right. Uh, or you're doing work and come back into the meet. Uh, or you can send me an email. Uh, either way will work. Otherwise, as we'd say in the land of my birth, hey Kunira, let's have a great day. Have a bit of a break from the screen at some point too. Yeah. Okay, team. Any questions? We all right? Yeah, a bit stunned. And the PPC, a great model, I tell you. Yes. Okay, do you want to ask now or do you want to wait? Okay. To write about it. Yes? Ah, yes, that's going to be a bit tricky. Yes. Oh, okay. 
So you're talking about for your presentation on, on famous economists, you're wanting specifically to talk about UBI. Yeah. So you're wanting to know what economist might be for the UBI. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, because all I know right now is um, Martin Luther King, who doesn't even count as an economist, and yeah. um, Philip von Par Paris, but he hasn't really done a lot about UBI. Yeah. And I, I, don't know, I don't know who to write about, yeah. Can I double check? We are talking about universal basic income? Yep. Yes, good. Um, just because, you know, I don't know what else other code it could have been that you might <laughs> be thinking about. Um, okay, yes. Uh, the problem is the idea of a universal basic income is actually quite a, well, it's a relatively modern phenomenon and all. Yeah? Um, so it will be a, a, what's called a contemporary economist. It'll be somebody who's around now. So um, you could look at some of the guys like, oh, what's his name, what's his name, what's his name? Gordon, I can see him right in front of me. Give me two seconds. See, that wasn't fast. Right. Had a brief there. Um, so Stiglitz, right, who's alive still. And he's quite old. Yeah. Um, oh, thank you. Was he also the author of Freefall? Oh, possibly. Um, mm -hmm. But he is very much into equality and equity. Uh, yes, okay. yes, the author of Freefall, yes. So The Price of Inequality, author of Freefall, uh, $3 trillion war, the true costs, globalization, right. yeah. So I think he might be your best bet. I can't okay. remember if he does talk about UBI. Um, possibly not in this book. Yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, do some research on him. Uh, but that's a really good book with regards to inequality. It's old now, and some of its references are quite dated. Mm. Uh, but it is a good book about inequality. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah, so that would be one, Stiglitz. Uh, so, yeah, so you'd probably be looking for a, con a, a modern, a contemporary economist. Right. Uh, any any other thoughts? Uh, oh, Gita. Gita, the uh, chief economist for the World Bank. Uh, uh, I'm not sure I'm familiar with what he's done. Um, she might be good. And there's uh, economists for the IMF. There'll be probably a couple of them as well. Mm. Uh, any other particular questions? Not from me, no. Not from you. Anybody else? No. Otherwise, team, you can you can go. You can go and work and work on your uh, work on the history of economic thought. Your famous economist. You can go back through some of the material from today. You can add extra depth to notes. You can start looking at the terminologies. Start adding to glossaries. Any and all of those. Okay. Okay, team, I'll stop the recording.